So I've done some research uh, on oil and gas past history in this area. Uh, and then I've done some attempt at doing a prognosis because what you all want to know is not what's happened since Titus. You want to know what's going to happen in the future. I can't tell you exactly, but I can give you some insights. So before I get on to the regular outline uh, of my presentation, let me, let me start by saying, this is your past. Every one of those dots, some, most of them are blue, some of them are orange. Every one of those dots and dots is the location of a well, an oil or gas well. The blue are gas wells, the orange are oil wells. That's your past. So the question you should have is, uh, should you be concerned about what might be in your future? Because the past is gone. Those are all conventional <coughs> gas or oil wells. Most of them were cracked. And that's probably the last time I'm going to use that word tonight. Um, but they've been mostly played out. This will never again be a large producer of conventional oil or gas, this being this region. So that's your past. Should you be concerned about your future? So I'm going to show you a couple of slides that come directly out of company presentations. Everybody know what a company presentation is? Once a year, SEC requires publicly owned companies to make a presentation to their shareholders about what they have done, what they will do, what it's going to cost, what their economic prognosis is. So this is the best way to see inside of a company and what they see. So if you're looking through the eyes of a company, you're looking through pretty accurate eyes. So this slide is taken from the company presentation by Range Resources. Range was the first company that developed shale gas in Pennsylvania back in 2004. They're still a very large operator in Pennsylvania. Let me interpret what you're looking at here. Clearly this is the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania. Here's the greater Pittsburgh area. We're up here someplace. And this color map shows the productivity of the Utica play. It's called the Point Pleasant play. Your Point Pleasant meets Utica. The brighter the color, if you notice down here, the more gas in place. That is, they've done enough exploratory drilling and production in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania to have developed this map. And it shows the hottest of hot spots right here. And then there's a very quick tapering off of the potential productivity as you go north and northwest and northeast. So I'm not showing you this to make you be happy and say, well, if there's not very much gas in the Utica underneath Erie, they're never going to come. That's not the message. Let me show you another presentation. This one by another large operator, Southwestern. Again, one of the largest operators in Pennsylvania over the last 10 years. They show more of a map. They show all the way out to northeastern Pennsylvania. And this includes the Marcellus, the Upper Devonian, and the Utica. GIP is gas in place. That means that the geologists working for this company have determined through exploration and production how much gas per square mile of, the, of these players they could expect to encounter. Obviously, the larger that number, the better it would be. Once again, you see that there is a very pronounced hot spot in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania, tapering off into the blue. So I'm going to spend two minutes explaining what's on this slide because it means everything. Money means everything. Gas operators don't do things for their shareholders willy-nilly. <coughs> They have to put money down a hole to get money out of a hole. So let me explain the current, underlying current economics of shale gas development during bust times. There was a boom in Pennsylvania. It lasted about five, six years, and now it's busted way down. So here we are. Notice we're not even in the blue. This is billion cubic feet of natural gas per square mile associated with each color. So if we were right here, you'd expect in that area, the Utica would have about 50 <coughs> billion cubic feet of natural gas per square mile available. That doesn't mean they can get out of the ground. That's what's down there. 50 billion is not like a big number, right? I bet it's 
larger than most of our mortgages. <laughs> but how big is the know you, by the way? How much natural gas does the United States consume in one year? Anybody know? Let's do it. 25 trillion cubic feet. So in one square mile in this blue area, you have a very, very, very small percentage of what the U.S. consumes. So obviously the industry would want to develop a lot of square miles, right? But here's one of the hidden truths about shale gas development. And it's one of the reasons I'm spending a lot of time on this slide before I even get into my regular presentation. Shale gas development is inherently inefficient. Shale gas development is inherently inefficient. As a licensed practicing professional engineer, I abhor inefficiency. It reeks of inelegance, ignorance, Rube Goldberg, bludgeoning, Texas style. Beat it to death and make it bigger, and maybe you get something out of it. So, using currently available advanced technology, the industry on average across the United States gets 10% of the gas in place out of the ground. One zero, ten percent. So this 50 billion cubic feet, if we can imagine that there's 50 billion cubic feet under every square mile in every county, they're only going to get five billion cubic feet. What's it going to cost? Well, let's see. Cost roughly five million dollars to drill a shale gas well. And as I'm going to show in a few minutes, it takes six to eight wells per square mile to get that 10% of the gas. So that's somewhere between 30 and 40 million dollars to get 10% of 50 billion cubic feet out of every square mile. 30 to 40 billion dollars. 30 to 40 million dollars. Well, that's what they're going to get if they can get the gas to market. What's it? I mean, that's what it's going to cost them to get the gas out of the ground. How much could they expect to be paid for that gas? Right, there's two sides of the ledger. You all have a bank account, right? Check it down. You don't just count the input, you have to count the output. So, if they get 5 billion cubic feet out of each square mile, what's the current price of natural gas as of this morning? Anybody know? Come on, you're all supposed to know that. When you get up tomorrow morning, you're supposed to go online and check the price of natural gas and the correct price of oil. Because it means everything. It means presidential elections. It means geopolitics. $2.28 a thousand. So I rounded it up to $2.50. So if you're getting 5 million cubic feet per square mile, and you're going to get $2.50 per million cubic feet, that's $12.5 million gross per square mile. Did that sink in yet? Does this checkbook balance? They're going to make, before taxes, before royalties, before cost of regulation, I was going to say before severance tax, but Pennsylvania doesn't have one. Yeah. Uh, they're going to make $12.5 million per square mile, and it's going to cost them 30 to 40 million. What does that mean? It means at today's prices, Underline that today's prices, they ain't coming your way. Where are they? This is a map put together yesterday from Drilling Info, which is the universal industry standard for information about gas and oil wells in the United States. Every one of those red dots is a unit of shale gas well producing today in the state of Pennsylvania. You'll notice the nearest one to you is, what's that, about 50 miles? Uh, and if you remember the colors, those wells are right here at the very edge. So you think they're making any money from those wells? Those are losers. They're all losers, except for these guys down in Lawrence and Weaver. Those are winners at today's prices. Marginally winners. Okay, so that's thousands of gas and oil wells within 50 miles of where we're sitting in the story. They're all conventional, most of them fracked. Not going to be any big production from those going forward. But I can tell you right now that in the foreseeable future, as long as the price of natural gas remains in the 
$2 range, there's going to be any unit of development here. Be careful what I just said. I did not say there will never be any unit of development here. The key number that I showed you there is the price of natural gas. What was the price of natural gas in October 2008? Because you don't know these things. <laughs> the fourth question. Okay, I'm an engineer. I ask questions that have no numerical answers. What was the price of natural gas? Remember, it's two dollars and twenty-eight cents today. What was it in October two thousand eight? Fourteen dollars and twenty cents. How will those numbers change if you multiply by six on the income side? Suddenly, it starts looking good. What happens if they get the price of natural gas to twenty dollars a gas? What happens to your gas bill first? What happens to your heating bill? What happens to your hot water bill? Isn't that what the industry is trying to do by exporting natural gas as liquefied? Okay, so the point I'm making here is you don't need to be picketing in the streets today to stop a, a drill rig from showing up a mile south of here. You might have to worry about that sometime in the future, and if you do, now we're into the main part of my presentation, why you should be picketing in the streets. Because if that does happen, what will be the impacts? How it will affect your lives, your property values, your children, your grandchildren, climate, air, water. So, of all the things I can talk about tonight, with the limited time we have together, I'm going to pick on two problems, two potential impacts, one of which is inherently local. It has to do with people who have private water wells, drinking water. And the other is inherently global, because it involves everybody on the face of the earth. So we'll address those two potential impacts. But before there, I have to tell you why when and if they come here, it will be different than those thousands of conventional wells that are already here. What makes the development of shale gas so inherently different and therefore so inherently much more risky with higher impacts than conventional oil and gas? Two things. And I'll explain it. spatial intensity, technologies of scale. Ready? Okay. Spatial intensity, what's that mean? I already hinted it. Um, if there's 5 billion cubic feet per square mile, surface of mile, and you want to develop trillions of cubic feet, you have to drill wells on thousands of square miles. And you have to drill 6 to 8 wells every square mile. That's spatial intensity. You need a hell of a lot of wells in a relatively small area. So I'm going to give you examples of spatial intensity, and I'll give you examples of technology of scale, and let you judge about whether the risks are higher in shale gas because of those two fundamental aspects. Okay, as simply as the industry can possibly explain it, and you'll notice that I consistently use industry documents, <coughs> industry data, industry information, industry graphics, industry videos to explain to you an industry that doesn't want to be explained. <laughs> this is from Chesapeake, another major operator. Here is a nice, roughly two square mile area, potentially just south of Erie, bucolic setting. They put together four pads. Each pad is a place where they do the drilling and the fracking. The pads are on a regular grid, roughly two miles by one mile. That's an inherent part of shale gas development, a regularized or as regularizable grid as possible of pads, roughly two miles apart in one direction, one mile apart in the other direction. Another inherent part is that from each pad, you're not drilling one well. That was the conventional style. You're drilling multiple wells, six, eight wells per square mile. <coughs> the other factor is that you're drilling them down and then you're drilling them out. So there's a more or less vertical part of the well and a more or less lateral part of the well. And I put dimensions on here to let you know that in this area, if you get down to Utica, it's more than 5,000 feet below our speed of us. And these laterals are going to be more than 5,000 feet long. So the wells themselves are going to be two or three miles long, mostly lateral. But the idea is to put as many wells as possible into that volume of shale. This is Utica. All right? 6, 12, 18, 24 wells 
the wells down here are only about 500 feet apart, and all this fuzzy stuff is supposed to indicate the word I don't want to use. It begins with that. <laughs> but you can see here that even with all that drilling, you're not going to access all that rock. That's one of the reasons we're only getting 10% of the gas. So that's an example of spatial intensity pictographically as a cartoon. Another aspect of spatial intensity is that when you have multiple levels of shale, each of which could be a potential producer, you can do what's called a stacked play. That is, you can drill down and one set of laterals will be in one level and another set of laterals will be in another level. So this conceivably, conceivably be the Marcellus, this conceivably could be the Utica. Technology that exists for that. From one well, you can access multiple shale plays. This is a map of Bradford County, four or five counties to the east of us. This is the New York Pennsylvania line. This is heaven, this is hell. <laughs> you got that one. <laughs> this, is two, this is three years ago. This is a map that shows by color the lease holdings of a number of different operators. So the yellow is open operator, red is another operator, blue. You'll notice that each of those areas is roughly a rectangle, roughly two miles by one mile, and there's a black dot, more or less in the center of each one, and that's the pad location. So you'll notice that most of Bradford County three years ago had been leased and developed. Bradford, unfortunately, along with Susquehanna and Green, are the three counties in Pennsylvania that will receive the brunt of the insult. By the time the industry is done in Bradford, there will be over 10,000 wells in that county. Did you hear what I said? 10,000 wells in that county. This is a, another development. This is the Barnett Shale Play in Texas. This is a two mile scale right here, here to here. Every one of those white dots is a pad. Where would you want to live there? That's spatial intensity. It's fundamentally necessary to hope to economically develop shale gas or oil. Um, that's what you have to do. A hell of a lot of wells per square area. What does that mean in terms of impact? It means higher risk. The more holes you put in the ground, the more wells you have, the more fracking you have, et cetera, to keep that point. Okay, what do I mean by technologies of scale? Why is that a differential between shale gas development and conventional gas development? Everything's bigger or longer. What do I mean by scale? Length and time. Larger drill rigs, they need doubles. They need a top hole rig. You pull the top hole rig out, they bring in a double or a triple because your well is three miles long. And it's not just drilling straight down, you have to drill down and out. And that takes a heck of a lot more power. So you need more diesel horsepower on the drilling motor. More diesel horsepower, more NOx emissions, more noise, longer. Larger fracking equipment, higher pressure, higher fluid volume, more diesel horsepower. All those hundreds or thousand oil gas, oil gas wells that have been drilled within 50 miles of the city tonight in the last 150 years, when they frack those wells, they use 50,000 gallons of fracking fluid, maybe 60,000. The Utica wells I told you are in production use 5 to 10 million gallons, 100 times more fracking fluid. That's a scale technology. Bigger. The more fluid you have, the more horsepower you need to pump it down the ground. 15,000 diesel horsepower to get that fluid underground. The more fluid you pump down, the more fluid comes back up as no longer fresh water, no longer drinkable water, but wastewater that leaves the water cycle. It's consumptive use. Some of it stays down there forever, some of it comes back up, gets in a truck, goes to Ohio, goes down an injection well causes human and size misty in Ohio, and then it's lost to you. Larger and longer flaring, more truck traffic, more pipeline miles, more and larger compression stations, higher emissions. Those are the enhanced risk factors that are the result of spatial intensity and technologies of scale. That's why shale gas and shale oil is much more risky and has much higher impacts on you than all the conventional oil and gas development. Here's another map of Bradford County, which shows what I mean by pipelines. Remember I showed you this one? 
This is the same county map, except now every one of those dots is a pad. So every one of those dots has multiple wells. And you'll notice that every pad has to be connected with a pipeline. Those are called gathering pipelines. How do you put a pipeline underground? It's not a rhetorical question. You dig a, you dig a trench. But first there were trees. So you get rid of the trees. And then you dig the trench, and then you lay the pipeline, then you cover it up, and they can't put the trees back. Here are the major transmission pipeline, and all those gathering lines have to go to compressor stations, so that the compressor station raises the pressure of the gas coming out of the gathering line, so it can go into a transmission line. So I'll let you calculate how many hundreds of miles of new pipeline has to be created in just that one county. And I'm going to show you what creating a pipeline looks like. So this is a video I took in West Virginia a few months ago. And they're in the process of clearing a right of way for a pipeline. I don't know about you, but I find that disgusting. They just killed a few thousand trees per mile. What did they do with the trees? You see what they did with them? They burned them. They create big piles of trees, pour kerosene on them, light them on fire, and burn them. Hardwood. Sustainability? This is a sustainable industry? First of all, they're killing thousands of carbon sequestration units per mile. Every mile of pipeline they put in, they're killing trees that absorb carbon dioxide. And then they burn the trees. Don't even donate the wood to the poor people in West Virginia who can't eat their homes because of Compressor stations. You've already got five new ones in Erie County in the last five years. There'll probably be more. So what's the problem with compressor stations? They're noisy and they emit. What do they admit? Hold your ears. That's a blowdown. The industry has wonderful words for things. Doesn't that look like a blowdown? It looks like a blow up. <laughs> That's a direct venting. Well, you don't flare from a compressor station. You might flare from a pad. But that's a direct venting. It goes on for hours and hours. Every compressor station does it periodically. Direct methane emission into the atmosphere. That noise, that'll keep you awake at night. All right, so that's the background. Why is shale gas so much different than conventional gas? Why should we be more concerned um, about impacts? Well, let's talk about two of those impacts. I promised you two of them. One local impact on private water wells, the other global impact on climate change. So we'll do the local one first. This is the leaky gas well problem. So you have gas wells, you have water wells. They're not supposed to mix. And the industry says they never do. If your water well suddenly is contaminated with methane, and the state of Pennsylvania classifies methane as a contaminant. It's in your regulations. Chapter 78, methane is a contaminant in Pennsylvania. So if your water well was fine, and you wake up one morning and it's fizzy, and you can light it on fire and attack, industry says that was a coincidence. <laughs> the methane was always there, you didn't know it. It's naturally occurring. I love the phrase they use. Can you tell, so I dare somebody in this room to point out an unnatural material. You didn't get that, did you? <laughs> what is an unnatural material? There ain't no such thing. So, if the industry to say that methane in somebody's water well is naturally occurring, well, of course it is. <laughs> the question is, where did it come from? Because I didn't have it before, and now I have it, and you're saying it's a coincidence. <clears throat> we'll talk about coincidences. And they say, well, our wells don't leak. We have four layers of steel casing and four layers of cement, and the wheel, the wells are sealed tight and they don't leak. But the industry 
itself knows that that's a lie. I've been to multiple workshops. There's probably a workshop being held on the face of the earth as we speak on the problem of leaking gas wells and oil wells. It's such a well-known, chronic, ubiquitous problem. The industry holds workshops on it virtually every week somewhere around the world. So I'm going to tell you what the industry knows. But first I want to show you what a leaking well could look like. So this is a wellhead. It's a well-known wellhead. It's the Gessler Three well in Dimmick, Pennsylvania. This is the, uh, the wellhead. This is the production casing. That's the centermost layer of steel pipe that goes all the way down to the bottom of the well and is supposed to transport gas to the surface inside it. That's the design intent. That's what engineers call the design intent. We have multiple layers of steel casing. In between the steel casing, there might or may not be cement. In this case, not so much. And the intent is whatever gas is encountered down here comes up, that steel pipe and goes to the market. So let's take a look at what happened to this well. Compressor stations. 
You've already got five new ones in Erie County in the last five years. There'll probably be more. So what's the problem with compressor stations? They're noisy and they emit. What do they emit? Hold your ears.
unless you have a device that can detect it. You can look at a weld end and say, hey, thinking. It's also not only possible, but happens many times that if you go to the weld end, you do not detect in any way, means, or form any leakage. That does not mean the weld is leaking down below. <coughs> So, absence of evidence of bubbling is not evidence of absence of leaking. We do not have technology. We do not have the technology to detect whether any oil or gas well is leaking below the surface. The only possible evidence that a well is leaking below the surface is when the leakage gets into somebody's groundwater. Try to prove that in the work. All right, so what I told you, I'm going to tell you what the industry knows about this chronic, ubiquitous <coughs> problem. Data directly from industry reports. How old is a well? What percentage of wells are leaking? <coughs> Young wells leak somewhere between 0 and 10% of the time. Brand new wells. As well as age, the leak rate goes up. Well known. More data directly from the industry. As the well age goes up, the leak rate goes up. Young wells leak <coughs> somewhere between 0 and 10% of the time. In Pennsylvania, we only have young shale gas wells. Of the 9,000 shale gas wells that have been drilled in Pennsylvania in 2004, 8,000 of them are fewer than 5 years old. So they're down in this category. So we should expect from previous industry experience to see somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the already drilled wells in Pennsylvania already leaking. We should also expect that a higher percentage will continue, will leak in the future. <coughs> All right, how are we going to show that? Well, here's what we did. My colleagues and I. We went to the PADEP database, publicly available, you can go to it tonight. If you want to go through what we went through for two years, you can check our numbers. We went to a database that had 75,000 inspection and violation records for over 41,000 oil and gas wells built in Pennsylvania over a 12-year period. We went back to 2000, looked at all the records that were available, publicly available, that you could download and read. Not just shale gas wells, but all oil and gas wells built in Pennsylvania, 41,000 of them during that 12 years. And then we did two things with that information. We mined it, analyzed it, to figure out which wells were already leaking. How many? Where were they? What kind of wells? Conventional, unconventional? Northeastern part of the state, southwestern, northwestern, central? How old were the wells? You can do a lot with data once you have it. That's the first thing we did, and I'll show you the results in a minute. Second thing we did is what you would like to know is, given that history of how many wells are leaking now and where they are and what time they are, what can we statistically project into the future is likely or probable to happen? So first we look backwards and then we project forwards using some very fancy statistical methods. And then we publish this in a paper that came out last year, peer reviewed. So here's what we found by looking backwards. We look at conventional wells across the state. About 1% of them were leaking. We looked at unconventional wells, which by definition, in Pennsylvania, the definition of an unconventional well is a shale gas well or a coal bed methane well. There were no coal bed methane wells in this period. So these are all shale gas wells. So conventional wells, 1% leaking. Unconventional wells, 6.2% leaking. Does that number look familiar? Remember, these wells are mostly in the age group, 0 to 8 years. I thought Pennsylvania had the toughest regulations in the world. I thought industry had learned how to drill and cement the base wells and never leaked. I thought they were, I thought they solved all this problem. Just same old stuff, same thing over and over again. All right? Looking forwards, using probabilistic techniques, we learn from the data from the previous 12 years, and then we project forward. So this is projection forward in years. If we drill a well today, 
What would we expect one year out, two years out, three years out, four years out? This is the probability of failure of a well. Probability that it's going to leak. This would be a 5% probability, a 10% probability, a 15% probability. Well, conventional wells, like the ones that have been drilled around here for over 100 years, we would expect that by year four, about 9% of them would be leaking. But Professor Grafman just showed that only about 1% of the conventional wells <coughs> in the previous 12 years. Ah, but we detected some anomalies in the data. One-fifth of all the conventional wells drilled in that 12-year period had no inspection reports. Did you hear what I said? There were no inspection reports publicly available for one-fifth of those wells. And where are those inspection reports? So we asked the people at the DADED, great people, by the way, we worked with a lot of them, good hearts, good souls, understaffed, underpaid, under-resourced. And what they said is, Professor Grafia, we will never know. We don't know where those reports are, we don't know where the reports are made, they're not anywhere we can find them, and they will never be online. So we will never know what happened to one fifth of those wells. We also found out that the inspection period, the time between any two inspections, has lengthened for conventional wells. Why? Where are the inspectors? Inspecting the unconventional wells. So we're projecting that by the four year period, if you were to drill an unconventional well today, eh, about 9% of them would be leaking. Unconventional, about 13%. More than one in every 10 will be leaking by year four, and that number just keeps going up over time. So what? What does this have to do with spatial intensity and technologies of scale? If gas wells leak, that is a potential source of hydrocarbons to get into the water table and into people's private water wells. That should be obvious. What we'd like to do is connect the dots. If we know how many gas wells are leaking, and we know where they are, and we know when they started to leak, and if we know which water wells start to become contaminated, and where they are, and when they start to get contaminated, we should connect those dots. Who's we? <laughs> Who should be connecting those dots? <laughs> Whose responsibility is it? Mine? Yours? Who do we pay to do the job? DDP. Can they do the job? Sure. Will they do the job? If they're given the resources and the time. So we're using their database to find out which wells are leaking where those wells are and when they started to leak. We're using another database, which I'm about to describe, which was forced out of the PADEP by a court order. And that is, show us the database of which water wells have been contaminated. Where are they? When did they start to become contaminated? <laughs> so due to the investigative journalism of Laura Laguerre, formerly of the Scranton Times, now with a different organization, she asked for FOIA, PADEP, and said, give me all the letter, give me the record of all the letters that you have sent to private landowners saying that your water well has been contaminated by nearby gas companies. And DEP said no. Went to court, and the court said, yes, it's public information. So when you first when you first published your article a couple of years ago, they had about 209 incidents. Most of them in these three counties of uh, private water wells being contaminated by gas drilling. Since that time, the number has gone up to 260. It goes up about every month. You can find this information on the DEP database now. So, what's that got to do with spatial intensity? Remember this map? Those are all well pads and pipelines. This is a map of complaints of water well contamination. Darker the color, the more complaints. You see any correlation? This is the first beginning of connecting the dots. I and my colleagues at Cornell and PSE will be working as 
assiduously for the next few years trying to show statistically the correlation that exists. It has to exist. It's just never been brought to the public's attention. If in a particular township or a particular county I have 37 leaking gas wells, which water wells were contaminated by which ones when? Public has a right to know that. Can't know it today. Okay, lots of observations and implications about this private water well problem. They're obvious. Uh, tough regulation doesn't solve the problem. Modern shale gas at all doesn't solve the problem. And at this time, when the industry is in bust, they're cutting corners like crazy. Any way they can reduce the cost of developing a gas well. This is not the time that industry is going to great effort to cement case a well and remediate a leaking well. Global problem, this one affects everybody. Methane emissions and climate change. Again, another myth. Methane used to be a clean fossil fuel. <coughs> that became really risky because everybody knows that no fossil fuel is clean from a climate change point of view. Burning a fossil fuel produces carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, global warming agent, therefore, no fossil fuel can be climate free. So then they said methane is a cleaner fossil fuel. It's cleaner than coal, cleaner than burning oil because less carbon dioxide. Okay. Cleaner, but not clean. And lately they've been saying methane is a bridge fuel to a green renewable energy future. You didn't get this one yet, so let me explain it. <laughs> Despite the fact that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, I wound up being a civil engineer. Now you're thinking, I bet three, three quarters of the people in this room, as soon as I said civil engineer, thought bridge. Right? That's what civil engineers do. I know bridges. A bridge is something you construct that goes from this point in space to this point in space so you don't fall in what's between them. Are you getting it yet? <laughs> so we don't want to fall into the fossil fuel chasm, so we build a bridge of fossil fuels across it. <laughs> Yet. They've been drilled, 
most of them frack, but because of the lack of pipelines, they're shut in. There's a valve at the top, they shut them in, turn the valve off so nothing comes out. But periodically, somebody has to open that valve because the pressure builds up and they don't want to harm the well. So, the numbers they were measuring. 
Every one of these bars is above 1.9. That's explosive, that's explosive, that's explosive, that's explosive. 5,893 leaks in Washington, D.C. Who pays for that gas, by the way? Shareholders of the utility? Who pays for it? Great payers. There is absolutely no incentive for utilities to go out and buy and fix the leaks because they get paid for the gas whether you get it or not. The rates depend upon the volume of gas that goes into the pipeline divided by the number of rate pairs. Got that calculation? <laughs> Pretty neat, huh? All right. Uh, colleagues of ours at Purdue and Penn State and Cornell and a couple of other places have decided to go measure methane emissions in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania. Yeah, here's Pittsburgh, Green County. Uh, using an aircraft equipped with the same sort of sensor that they were using in Washington, D.C. We flew over that county on a couple of days during the summer of 2012 and then calculated how much methane was being emitted, unburned, in that county. Somewhere between 4% and 12%. That's as close as you can get to range. Not zero. Somewhere between 4 and 12. So I'll give you a number as high as 9, 2.37. 4 to 12. This is the latest using satellite techniques for detecting methane concentration across North America. This is 2006 2008 before big developments in Marcellus, Bakken, and Eagleport. This is 2009 2011. Darker the color, the higher the concentration of methane. And they calculated that. In the Bakken, somewhere between 7 and 10 percent of the methane is leaking. In an Eagle Ford, somewhere between 6 and 9 percent is leaking. Summary. Here's what we predicted in 2011, somewhere between 3.6 and 7.9 percent. Here's what the EPA estimates. <laughs> Do you know how they get that estimate? Anybody know how it works? Does the EPA go out and make measurements? Have the money. So they ask industry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's Bakken, Eagle Ford, Marcellus, Uinta, Denver, Julesburg, and now the 13, as I said, 13 independent studies have been published in peer reviewed literature. The weighted average across the country is 3.8%. Probably higher than that, but that's, that's a conservative consensus science so far, 3.8%. Sounds low. Who cares about the 3.8% leaks? But we haven't answered the second question, which is, what is the impact of any amount of leaks? Is 1% too much, or does it have to be 50% before it becomes significant? Rhetorical question about the answer. All right, here we go. Ready? Here's a kilogram of methane. See it? Here's a kilogram of carbon dioxide. See it? I just shot them up in the atmosphere. I'm going to wait 20 years or wait 100 years and see which one warms the climate more. Very complex calculation can be done. Let's call the amount of warming that carbon dioxide does one. So we can compare one to some other number. That number is called the global warming potential, GWP. It's how much more warming another gas does compared to carbon dioxide. In this case, we're talking methane. If you wait 20 years, and if you were, if it were 1996, then the number would be methane is 56 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a global warming agent. If you wait 100 years, it's only 21 times more. Fast forward, this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which every seven or eight years issues a consensus science report. Here's what we know about climate change. Here's what we know about the science that underpins it. They updated the numbers, 56 to 72, 21 to 25. Notice that 25 is today. Fast forward to the most recent report from the IPCC, 56 is now 86, 21 is now 34. 
As science progresses, we better understand how various greenhouse gases act in the atmosphere. We now know that methane is extremely potent greenhouse gas, much more so than carbon dioxide. Therefore, it's important. All right, how much is too much? Or how little is enough? I'll explain that with this chart produced by the Environmental Defense Fund. Not my favorite organization. Horizontal axis is the number of years that climate would benefit, but it would decrease the impact on climate change. So you would slow down global warming. How many years would it take? If you wanted to convert the entire truck fleet in the United States from diesel to natural gas, if the leak rate was one of these numbers. So this is the leak rate. So the EDF, using very good science, very good calculations, calculated that for the leak rate of 8 tenths of 1% or less, we ought to convert our truck fleet to natural gas. <laughs> Knowing what you know now about the leak rates, we have to do things to do. If we were to convert all our gasoline-driven cars, gasoline to natural gas, the leak rate would have to be less than 1.4%. We'd have to be thinking of it. If we wanted to convert all of our coal-fired power plants to natural gas to generate electricity, the leak rate would have to be less than 2.7%. My opinion, I think we're somewhere around here, which means it would take somewhere around 35 to 40 years or there would be a net climate benefit for us to switch across this bridge, this green renewable wind. Okay, it would take 35 to 40 years before there's any net climate benefit to switch it. So should we switch? Who makes that decision? Shareholders, regulators, and legislators. P. Boone Pickens, Koch Brothers, President Obama, who makes that decision? Okay, so let's talk about energy policy here for a few minutes. So we've got time left. Over what period of time should we measure the impact? Remember, I just showed you here that depending upon what period of time you use, you can use different numbers. You could make methane appear much less important say, let's average things out over 100 years. Let's suppose you have 100 years to work on climate change. Suddenly, instead of being 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide, methane is only 34 times. This is called political wiggle room. All right. So which period of time should we use? 20 years, 100 years, 8 years, 2 years? What would you think? Do you think the climate reads government reports? <laughs> do, do you think the atmosphere responds to the debates in Congress? I don't think so. Chemistry is chemistry. The climate does what the climate does, depending upon the science of physics and chemistry. And the IPCC made that very clear in their last report. Because politicians were saying, let's use the 100 years, because it makes methane not look so bad. And the IPC said, no, well, sorry. I wanted to start with this one before I talked about the IPC. Remember I told you the White House, the ambassador, <coughs> this is 2011, Stephen Chu, former US Energy Secretary, Nobel Prize winner, in public, said that we were not credible. Look what happened in four years. White House issues a strategy to reduce methane emissions last year. Oops, methane's important. <laughs> August of this year, Clean Power Plan, CPP. Every state has to figure out a way of reducing its carbon dioxide and methane emissions. Ooh, it's important. That's good. We were, we saw this, we said, hey, good lessons. They, they, they didn't have to believe us in 2011. They, could, they didn't believe us in 2011, but the science was done, and now we know that there's a lot more methane getting out there than we thought, and the impact on that, of methane on climate is higher than we thought. 
More methane, higher impact, more importance. So just how important is it? This is what the IPC said last year about the 20 year versus 100 year. The choice of time horizon is a value judgment. There's nothing scientifically that says you should use the 20 year or 100 year. The climate's going to react the way the climate's going to react. You set policy depending upon the science. It's called science based policy. You don't see to use policy based science. This is policy based science because the clean power plant, look at the number they're using. Let me remind you that number 25 is from 2007 and it's 100 years. So the government is explicitly saying we have 100 years to work on climate change and we're going to use science, which is eight years old. That's a value judgment, isn't it? It is. It's a value judgment. Last two slides. Let me tell you why this 20 year versus 100 year thing is really important. We don't have 100 years to work on the problem. This is global warming in one slide. Past, future, year. This chart was made in 2009. So this was actual global warming measurements in 2009. We were 7 tenths of a degree centigrade warmer than we were in 1900. There's the global warming index. And in 2009, the scientists who wrote this paper used the best available science, the best available computer software, and the most powerful computer in the world, and did multiple simulations of what the future might be, knowing what we know about carbon dioxide and methane. And they did four projections. Each of these is called a scenario. Scenario number one is this purple line, and that's called business as usual. Continue to, re continue to produce fossil fuels, to burn fossil fuels at an increasing rate. That's what we're doing. Even since 2009, we're still doing that. Every year, we're burning more and more fossil fuels. It's also the Obama administration energy policy, all of the above. Computer simulation says that by the time we get to 2042. 2042. That's not 100 years from now, is it? It's not 20 years from now. Computer simulation says if we keep doing what we've been doing, we're going to hit 2 degrees centigrade. Now we might not. Here's the error bar. These are computer simulations. They're not exact. So it could be that that line goes over to here, in which case we get 2 degrees centigrade by 2030. Or it could be that that line goes down here, in which case we don't get 2 degrees centigrade to 2080. But we're certainly going to double where we are now, which is 9 tenths of a degree centigrade. If we were to have enacted five years ago carbon dioxide reduction measures across the country, reduce the amount of fossil fuels being burned, the computer model says 2045. Another cruel number. It's really cruel that the climate does not respond quickly to a change in carbon dioxide emissions. It's a cruelty on our children and our grandchildren. 80% of all the carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution was put there by the United States of America. And we have no way of getting it out. No feasible way. And because it's there, and because the climate does not respond quickly to a reduction <coughs> in emissions, nothing much happens. If we were to start reducing emissions today, and we, we didn't do it four years ago, so now we're already here, we're going to get, with high probability, still to that 2 degree centigrade change. The obvious thing we should have been doing, starting back here, is to reduce carbon dioxide, methane, and soot. You see black carbon, soot, diesel exhaust. 
burning young in India. If we had started back here to drastically reduce over a longer period of time our use of fossil fuels and the emission of methane, then the computer model would say there's a real good chance that we never get to two degrees, but we're locked in one and a half. It's too late to have wishful thinking, folks. Global warming will continue. Inertia, well, climate inertia will continue. The temperature rise will continue. The question is, how far out into the future are even the worst things going to happen? That's science. But we're talking about policy. We should be talking about science-based policy, not policy-based science. So if science says business as usual takes us by 2040, darn close to two degrees centigrade. Last question. U.S. Department of Energy every year puts out an energy forecast. Various forms, charts, documents, data. This is the most important one. This is looking back from 2013 to 2018 what kinds of energy we consumed in the United States. So in 2013, 27% of all the energy consumed for all purposes, electricity, heating, hot water, 27% of all the energy consumed came from natural gas, 36% came from petroleum, 18% from coal, 8% from renewables. Your Department of Energy, your Energy Information Agency, which is part of the Department of Energy, which is part of the Obama administration, forecasts that in that same year, 2040, where science says business as usual is deadly, forecasts business as usual. Do you see any substantial difference between here and here? Oh, they gave us from 8% to 10% increase in renewables. I think that's likely. What if it is? You see the contrast here between science and policy? Is this science-based policy? Science-based policy would say, this can't be true. We must do something in this period of time, from 2015 to 2040, we must do something so that this blue thing gets a lot bigger, and that blue thing gets a lot smaller, and that black thing goes away, and this thing gets smaller. That's what we have to do. Right. At the end of my talk, when I was over here, you say, well, what if Professor Kraft would throw a lot of information today? What do we do about it? Decrease your demand for that, for that, for that, and for that, and increase your demand and use of that. So, summary. Everything I just told you, can you summarize it in one sentence? If you can legally do it, 
and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court seems to be dithering on whether you can legally do it. Use your powers of zoning to control shale gas development. Make sure everybody understands the most important problem, the water quality contamination notwithstanding, that affects thousands of people. This problem affects seven billion people. What we do in Pennsylvania affects people in Bangladesh. Does it make any sense to pull a molecule of methane out of the Utica 7,000 feet under the theory and put it in the pipeline and send it to Cove Point, liquefy it, put it on the ship, send it to Italy and burn it in Rome? Finally, clarify the complex intermingling of the policy, the science, the technology, and the engineering. We have conflicting events on a global scale. We have the oil and gas industry's attempt to have a higher return of investment for its shareholders. That's conflicting with climate change. We have the attempt to use shale gas and oil as a geopolitical problem. <coughs> And that's conflicting with renewables. So how do we resolve all those conflicts at the policy level? You resolve the conflicts based on science, and the science says, here are things that you have to do. There will be losers. Shareholders will be losers. And we might not be able to use oil and gas as a geopolitical club cutting. We might not be able to control Putin with shale gas from Pennsylvania. You know, you're doing a poor job of that right now, that's for sure. <laughs> so, I do things, I say things. If my challenge to you is figure out what you're going to do. I already hinted. In your everyday lives, decrease your demand for fossil fuels. I'm not saying shut off your gas and water heater right now. I'm not saying live in the dark. Do what you can to decrease your demand for fossil fuels and substitute the demand for renewables. Do what you can in the voting booth. Do what you can in advocacy. Try to convince your local, state, and national leaders about doing the right thing scientifically on the basis of policy. So thank you all very much for your attention and your